Good morning or good uh, afternoon uh, and welcome to this last meeting of the application development uh, virtual group. Uh, so oh, here we are. So the application development uh, virtual group uh, is, uh, as the name implies, a virtual group. Uh, we are dedicated uh, to uh, deliver content uh, and training and information uh, that uh, is suitable for every developers in every platform uh, that are just using the Microsoft Data Platform. So it's not only SQL Server or Relational Databases or .NET, it's also Cosmos DB, it's also uh, Python, it's also R, it's everything that allows a developer to uh, leverage uh, its full potential, uh, the Microsoft Data Platform. Um, I took the lead uh, of the virtual group uh, at the beginning of 2017 and you can uh, see my uh, details in these slides and if you want to contact me to propose session or to participate as a speaker just feel free to do so please. Um, we are part of the PASS organization. PASS organization is a global community uh, of data professional that again works uh, with the Microsoft Data Platform. Registration is free. Uh, I really invite you to register. Um, you always have a lot of interesting uh, events, articles, uh, and uh, resources for your work. And so, plus it's free, so uh, it really makes sense to register and get connected to all other uh, people working on the data platform. Uh, virtual groups uh, are uh, a way uh, that pass, um, allows you to get in contact with uh, new technologies or new uh, people. We are just one of the many. We are the application uh, development uh, virtual group, but there are many uh, divided by um, language or even um, topic like data architecture and data science, but if you are more comfortable to uh, listen or to speak uh, uh, just with your language like Spanish or Italian for example, you can also find uh, almost surely a virtual group uh, uh, that suits your needs. And uh, uh, this is also the last meeting of 2017, so we'll meet again 2018. I'm just working right now on the schedule. I will post it soon on our uh, uh, on the website and also as a mail. And now let me introduce uh, today's meeting. And today's meeting is about the new Entity Framework Core 2.0, uh, which is um, I'm sure you know it's a, a, a object relational mapping tool that is you know, improved and born out of the uh, entity framework that is now quite well known and uh, adopted uh, all around the world. And uh, Chris Woodruff is the speaker that is going to uh, show all the new cool stuff that Microsoft uh, Entity Framework 2.0 has. My, uh, Chris is a long time speaker say, and developer and uh, I'm really happy to have him here speaking about this cool stuff. So thank you a lot, Chris, for uh, uh, presenting. Thank you. So I'll now hand over everything to you so you can tell us anything about this new cool stuff in Entity Framework Core, right? Oh, you, yeah, let's go. Yeah. Uh, and just uh, um, a little thing before handing ev over everything to you, if anyone has uh, questions, uh, uh, just write it uh, in the questions pane. We'll try to answer as soon as the questions uh, are done, or depending on how much time we have, we may uh, also answer at the end of the session. Yeah, Thank you very please. Much. Yep. Yeah. Go yeah, on. please do. Just, just if anyone has questions, let me let me know, and David will stop me and yeah. and ask those. So, Absolutely. please ask anything. So, again, we're going to take a look at Entity Framework Core Two. Uh, it was released when .NET Core Two was uh, released back around August. Um, so, let's dig into this. Um, so again, my name's Chris Woodruff. There's a picture of me if you want to see what I look like. Uh, I am a develop, developer advocate at JetBrains. So JetBrains is a maker of development tools such as ReSharper and Rider and IntelliJ. We have a lot of different IDs and, tech, and products. Uh, but for the .NET world, most people know us by ReSharper. Uh, we also have Rider, which is our cross-platform .NET uh, IDE. 
And on top of that, I'm also a PAS board member. I sit on the board of PAS. I'm uh, currently the director of community development. Um, and I wind down being on the board at the end of December. So I really looked, I really had a great time this year being on the board and helping out. So the agenda today is we're going to take a look at um, some new features of uh, EF Core. I'm going to call it EF Core. So uh, Entity Framework is kind of a long name. So we're going to take a look at EF Core 2.0. So here's all the different things we're going to take a look at, new features. And we're going to have some demos in here. And some things we're not going to have demos. I'm just going to have some slides explaining. But uh, let's move on. So. When the Entity Framework team uh, brought out Core 2.0 of the product, they were really looking at a number of things that they wanted to release. One is they wanted it to be uh, to to, uh, to meet the standard of .NET Standard 2.0, and we'll talk about that in a second. They also wanted to increase and improve the the quality of the product. Um, 1.0 was a good product. It was lacking in certain ways. Um, they just wanted to tighten it up and do a lot of bug fixes that the community found. They also wanted to, to tighten it up for the performance. And it is really a lot quicker, a lot more uh, efficient. Uh, they also wanted to close the feature gap of EF6. Now, EF6 is is the uh, product, is the entity framework that goes along with the .NET framework. So currently it's up to .NET framework uh, 4.7.1, or is it 0.2? It, 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 it's moving so quick right now that it's hard to keep up with versions. But um, EF6 dot some version is really geared towards the framework. Now, I do want to say that not all the features of EF6 will come into Entity Framework Core 2. And some of the features, new features of uh, Entity Framework Core 2.0 may not get brought back into uh, Entity Framework 6. So just know that they are two different tools. So if you do certain things in EF6, and you want to do those in Entity Framework Core 2.0, it may not, you just have to take a look at the feature, feature by feature. Um, so just a heads up with that. And then they wanted to, to have Entity Framework Core be a, be a reusable building block that the, uh, the .NET Core community could use. So if anyone doesn't know about the .NET standards, um, in the in the old way of thinking, we used to have portable class libraries, and those portable class libraries could be shared with in certain ways and couldn't be. Uh, it was a little confusing. Microsoft went back to the drawing board and came up with the idea of .NET standard. And what .NET standard is? It's not a technology. It's really a um, it's a standard. It's a uh, explicit um, protocol, so to say, and it, it really is a list of, of APIs. And then if you take a look at the .NET standard 2.0, you'll see that it contains a number, a huge number of APIs that can exist and has to exist in that standard. So I, I put down here all the different platforms that uh, we as Microsoft developers can use. So we have .NET Core, .NET Framework, Mono, all the Xamarin, uh, Universal Windows Platform, and even the in the old Windows APIs and Windows Phone and Windows Phone Silverlight, which are pretty much, uh, we're seeing those kind of go off in the sunset. As you can see, on the right-hand side, .NET Standard 2.0 works with uh, .NET Core. It works with uh, Entity or uh, with .NET Framework 4.6.1. Uh, 
So if you're still working in uh, .NET Framework 4.5 as, as an example, let's say you're working in uh, .NET Framework 4.5.1. As we can see here, that meets the standard of .NET Standard 1.2. Now that has a unique API list to it and any API that exists in anything greater than 1.3 you cannot have, you don't have permission to use that with uh, uh, 4.5.1 of the .NET framework. So, so just know that with each progression in the .NET standard, there will be a greater and greater number of APIs that get brought underneath that spec. So I just want to make that clear that um, that every .NET developer should probably start understanding the .NET standard um, idea. So let's get into the first thing that we're going to look at with Entity Framework Core 2.0 and that's improved link translations. So what we're, what we're talking about is, as an example, the uh, EF Core 2.0 now has the ability to do a like. So as we see here, we have a link statement. And what you'll probably see that's new is in our where clause, we have this thing called ef.functions.like. Now ef is a, is a uh, library. And underneath that, we have functions. And really, the only new, the only function in there that you can use is like. And what like is, is it's just like, it's just like the SQL like. So what we can do is we can give it a uh, string or a, really it's a string and then give it a wildcard uh, in the form of a string. So what this is saying is we want all customers that have a customer name that starts with an A. And uh, so what we get back with that is just like what you would expect in a, uh, in a SQL select statement is um, we get select uh, ID name from customer where name like a wildcard. So it's pretty easy. Um, I do have a demo that will uh, show that. So let's jump over here and bring up Trusty Visual Studio. And in here we have a program and this this little uh, console program um, sets up a, really it sets up a, a database down here, but but in the main method what we're doing is we are searching for blogs that have cat. Now, now the service dot uh, search blog is over here in another class. So we have our blog service class that has a method in it called search blogs. And it takes in a term, we set up a, a string variable called like expression, and we insert that that term in between two wildcards. So what we're what we're going to say is we want all blogs that have inside of the name of that blog or the URL, sorry, the URL of that blog, that term. As we can see here, we are getting back all of our blogs where and inside here we have this ef functions dot like and then we're saying we're going to use the blog URLs so the URL text and then we're going to apply the like with the wildcard that we that we set up above with the input term parameter and let us run this Let me bring over my console as we can see it. I have, I do have logging turned on 
in here, so you'll see that there's a lot more stuff that comes back. But what you can see here in the console, and I will make my console a little larger so people can see it. So let's do that. Okay, so that's probably better. So what we can see is we can see the uh, the explicit uh, SQL statement that we did, but in the end we can see that we had two blogs come back uh, because each one had cat, which was sent over. One had catfish and one had cats. So both of those came over because it matched that wildcard. So really it's it's very easy to do the like. Uh, you just have to use ef.functions.like and you're off and running with, with now uh, building upon using even more SQL uh, functionality. So that was kind of missing in the in the past. Let me go back to my so now let's look at another new feature of Entity Framework Core 2.0, and that's owned entities and table splitting. So what this really is um, is if we had two classes in here, if we had a customer class, and that customer class has an ID, it has a name, and then it has a physical address, and that physical address type is called address for the customer, and then we had this other class that uh, was for the physical physical address type, and in there we have uh, a string of street address and then just a location. Kind of simple, uh, just to show two different classes. But what we could do now is down below, when we build out uh, our model using our model builder, we can set up uh, for the entity customer type, we can say that uh, customer owns one of an address. And what that will do is it will enforce that constraint that a customer can only have one address, one physical address assigned to it. Um, so it will allow you to build your, your uh, entity framework models with some more constraints that, uh, that you might want in there so that you don't have to, to do that checking and, and build in and build some code to do validation to make sure that in this example, a customer only has one address. Now, I don't have a demo for this. I just wanted to show you that, that we could do this in the model builder when we're creating our uh, DB context. Chris? Yes. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I think we have a question that it makes sense to take now before going too far with sure. other topics. So um, Dick asked uh, about functions like, so, and so it's even the, the feature you showed before. So the, the question is why uh, you have to use functions dot like, can you use a simple dot contains method? So it's more on the like function you showed before. Yeah, so so uh, the ef.functions is is now a new part of Entity Framework Core 2. So we have to use that because that's where that that like method resides. So I, I hope I, I think I David, do you do you think that's what yeah, he's the, asking? Uh, yeah, I think that the main uh, question here is uh, why you couldn't just use a dot contains method, but my bad, as you explained, is because behind the scene, the um, yeah. uh, like operator wouldn't be used by SQL Server, it, right? It wouldn't. Yeah, when when any of the framework would would create that that uh, select statement in the background that would get sent back to the database, contains doesn't actually uh, create the like statement in in um, in calling the database. Yeah. So now ef.functions.like actually explicitly creates um, that like in the in the SQL behind the scenes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So this will improve performance because say you have like 10,000 rows, if you just use contains, uh, SQL Server or database will return the 10,000 rows and then the, uh, let's say the contain method will be um, will be yes. done on the on the application side, right? While with the li with the like method, the 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 filter is pushed to the database, so only the uh, interested interested the uh, rows will be returned. You're exactly right, David. So okay. thank you for for stating that exactly. So we're we're putting more of the work and more of the the yeah. effort back on the database server. Thanks. So now we have global query filters. So this is kind of an interesting, I, I like this new feature. So, so let's take a look at it. So if we, if we had the, uh, when we're building out our, our model for our uh, any framework DB context, we can actually uh, explicitly say in here, you know, I'm going to add I'm going to add my entity uh, of type post. So think of this as a blog and then we have blog posts. So if I'm building out my model and uh, I have a, a field for my post class that corresponds to a to a database table in the back and there's an is deleted uh, uh, property and column. So if there's a column in my database table called is deleted that corresponds to a property in my post class, you know, sometimes I don't want to bring back deleted items. You know, if they're deleted, I'm going to delete them. Uh, I don't want them brought back in any of my queries that I'm going to uh, be calling and creating and using. So the nice thing is I can I can now create this has query filter and what that will do is as this example that will not allow any deleted posts in this example to come back. So I don't have to worry about that going forward. I don't have to build that into any of my if I if I build a query to get a say all my all my blog posts uh, for 2016 if I just create a simple uh, link statement that says that I don't have to put in anything about uh, keeping out any of the deleted deleted posts this automatically will assume that I don't want any deleted posts and not return those uh, to it doesn't really matter what query that I do. Now you can't override this, so just just know that if you do one of these query filters, it is set for the lifetime um, of the application, at least until if you want to remove it, you'll have to remove it in the code and then recompile your your application. So if we were to go out and build something like this and say like context.blogs.include uh, and then posts and then first and default and then come back and try to get a uh, all the uh, my blog and then include all the posts for that blog this will not include any any deleted blog posts so uh, I do have a demo for this. So let's uh, go out and bring up Entity Framework again. Do I have, yes I do, there it is. So in here, I have another console app. I'm gonna be doing a lot of really small console apps. Uh, in here, I have the, what I pretty much described before. Um, I going out for each blog that's out in my database. I'm going to bring it back and uh, do some stuff with it. But what is happening in here is if I go down to my blog context, 
Um, I actually, in my on model creating, when I set up everything, I actually put that same that same uh, entity filter in here. So it's entity and then post type, and then I set up my has query filter, and then so I'm saying that uh, any post that is not deleted will get returned back through filters or through queries that uh, go out and, and get posts. Now that will even um, do subqueries. So that will include if I do an include to say blog, give me, bring back the blog and all the blog posts, it will also not return any deleted blog posts. So um, if I run this one, I'm sorry, all my consoles are going off into my primary. So you'll see that it returns back in the end, it's going to return black back each one of my blogs and then a blog post under each. And those are all deleted, is deleted, is false. So it did not return back any uh, blog posts that had is deleted of true. So just want to make that clear, show you that working example. Uh, again, you know what, it's not, this isn't really hard, it's just some new, some new uh, functionality that's added. So I hope people can use, can use this also. So let's go on to the next improvement. And this is one of my actually favorite things that, that uh, the Entity Framework core team did. Uh, so it's DB context pooling. So in the old days, we would have to, um, if we were to have this uh, controller and we were going to call the index uh, action on this controller, what this would do is through the .NET uh, core dependency injection, we would get the, the blog context coming in through the through the uh, constructor. And every time we called this controller's uh, action uh, of index, a new context would be spun up for us to, uh, to use. And so if we take a look at this, uh, our DI container, if no one really understands, uh, and if you haven't really looked at .NET Core yet, .NET Core, one of the best things that I like about it is it has de dependency injection built into it from the start. So .NET Framework didn't have dependency in injection uh, built in, and you had to kind of use third-party or external libraries to handle uh, dependency injection. But with .NET Core, it's built in from the start. Uh, you can just use it, and it is it is so helpful to uh, to developers, I think. So in this in this case, if we were using this controller, what would be coming back from the dependency injection container is that I would be calling this this uh, controller blogs controller, the index action, and it would create and give me a blog index or blog context, and if I called it two more times, it would create two more blog context uh, uh, objects. And each one would have to be created and then spun up and then handed off to that controller. Well, the nice thing now is we can now say, I want a context pool that has a number of already built and waiting um, objects waiting for them to be used. Um, so in this case, the DI container for .NET Core would have, in this case, a number, it's showing five, but it might not be five. It, it really depends on 
on what is happening back in the dependency injection uh, container, but it would have a number of contexts, DB contexts that would be already spun up and ready to go from the very get-go. And so if I were to call this controller and the action, index action on it, it would hand off an existing uh, uh, context for the blog context back to this controller. And again, it would send back two already created um, blog contexts for every, for the next two also, like is shown here. So what this really is doing is it is allowing you to have a more, um, uh, the perform performance of your application is going to greatly be improved. And I'll show you a demo in a second uh, how how much uh, we can improve your uh, the performance of using DB context within Entity Framework Core. So what we have to do is when we're when we're setting up uh, our services. So if we're adding services to our service pipeline. In the past and currently, uh, we can do an add DB context and then we give it the, the, uh, the context uh, type and then we can say options. In this option, we're going to use, uh, we're saying we're going to use SQL Server and we give it a connection string so that the DB context knows um, all the information how to connect back to the SQL Server uh, instance. The only thing we have to do, and this is this is amazing, the only thing we have to do to get DB context pooling uh, working is exchange deep add DB context with add DB context pool. That's all we have to do. So uh, if you have ASP.NET, say you have an ASP.NET Core MVC application, uh, and you are using uh, add DB context to add your DB context to the to the application services. All you have to do is replace it with add DB context pool, and uh, you will see a huge uh, performance gain in your application. So let's take a look at that demo. And that one is context pooling. So down here, let me go down to the startup and let me remove. Now, let me take a look at the original addDB context and I'm gonna run this now to show you some numbers running this, this application. Pull over here. As you can see, when this is running, it should start showing up pretty soon. So you can see that uh, it's giving us some numbers to show us um, the number, the context creations per second, and then how many requests that we, we kind of took we were allowed to, uh, to do. So we had total context creation. We had 167 contexts created during the lifetime uh, of the execution of this of this application and then we did uh, 14 requests per second so now let's take a look and see what happens when we exchange add DB context uh, with add DB context pool so that's what we're gonna look at now let's run this again and see what our numbers look like compared to what they were before. So as you can see, it's running through my creation, my all my steps in my application. And now we had 28 total context created and we 
had 15 requests per second. So we did increase, we decreased the number of contacts that were created during the lifetime, the execution of this application. We also increased the, the requests per second that we this application could handle. Uh, so just by switching and using DB contacts pooling, uh, you will see some you will see performance gains. Now, I do want to let you know that you will possibly have some startup increases because uh, DB context pooling has to kind of create some initial DB context for the uh, for the pooling. So there may be some some it slight increases to the startup of your application, but for me, most of the time that I'm using EF. Uh, core 2.0 is it's with web applications uh, or my web API projects and um, I'm going to have those running for for a while and I don't really mind having a slight increase in startup uh, to give me an overall performance boost throughout the lifetime of my my web application or my web API application. David, do we have any questions at this point? Yeah, uh, we have one question that uh, is related to the uh, connection pool, the context pool, okay. and it asks, does the ADB connect context pool allow devs to specify number of cached items, for example, the size of the pool? Uh, as of right now, I am not, I don't think that you can. Uh, it basically will create a number of of uh, DB contacts behind the scenes, and if it needs to add more, it will add those and add those to the pool, and then give those out as needed. Okay. So as of right now, no, I, yeah. I don't think you can explicitly say I want to start with four four DB contacts and then move on from yeah. there. And uh, same uh, related question is: Can you specify a ramp down? So, for example, the cache lifetime. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so there, there really isn't going to be these DB contacts aren't are not going to be uh, are not going to stale out. They're not going to like become stale like data can in in a in a cache. So, no, there really isn't a. There really isn't any need to recycle DB contexts. Um, these DB contexts are actually created and stay static throughout the uh, the lifetime of your application because they're all kind of done uh, at the startup of your of your application. So um, as of right now, there isn't a way to to say in your program that I'm aware of. Uh, to say flush out the the pool and start and and start over again. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the next thing that we can do is is another interesting new feature, uh, string interpolation in raw SQL methods. So basically what we're really just saying is now we can we can explicitly have raw raw SQL statements inside of EF uh, core and we can actually incorporate uh, parameters inside of inside of these raw SQL methods so let's take a look at at this so um, we have initially we have a, a variable a string variable that holds Redmond and Inside here, we have a, a using statement that creates our DB context. But in in here, we have a from SQL uh, method, and inside there, we have a raw SQL statement. So for people that still maybe you have a very complex uh, SQL statement that you cannot. Uh, create that using link. Maybe uh, as an example, uh, you want to use grouping. So grouping is uh, something that is not supported 
Actually, I don't think it's supported in EF6, and it's not supported explicitly using the fluent language of link. You can't do a grouping. So if you did want to use grouping in a SQL statement, you would have to possibly use this, this method here. Uh, another thing that you could use in this raw SQL methods is calling uh, stored procedures. So EF Core uh, 2.0 does not have any built-in way to call um, stored procedures, but this could be a way that you could call stored procedures. But it's really this this uh, uh, raw SQL methods are really for people that that have that have hit a roadblock and need to have um, an explicit SQL statement that they cannot get represented in link. Uh, it's, that would be kind of my interpretation of why they added this, this uh, feature into uh, EF Core 2.0. So in my, in my raw SQL method, I just say select star from customers where city, and then I have the city, and the city matches the variable from above. And what this will do is, behind the scenes, it will create a parameter in my SQL statement that would be, that would be uh, sent back to the um, database server to say it's SQL server. And in the end, I'm going to have a select statement that has that parameter replaced with uh, Redmond. So this is nice because um, I can set this up and uh, this also will not uh, be affected by the dreaded uh, SQL injection uh, bugs. So uh, they're a little safer. These raw SQL methods are a little safer to use. So um, if you were to, to, uh, to do this. Now, you still can, can get uh, bad things that happen in here. So I would check, just, just to be safe, I would check any, any variables for uh, if you were using those as input, getting those from the user somehow. Um, you don't want uh, someone kind of building out a, a string input that drops a class or drops a table or drop, not drops a class, but drops a table or drops a view or drops something uh, in your database. So, so I guess you could still get some, some SQL injection uh, issues with this. Just, just be aware that uh, you need to be careful with this and, and check your, uh, your input, uh, your, uh, variables that are going to be used for uh, your input ver uh, parameters in your raw SQL methods. Uh, I don't have a demo for this one, but uh, it's pretty simple. You just say uh, from uh, SQL and you get the, uh, the raw SQL method functionality. So explicitly compiled queries. So these are, I, I, I like this feature. So um, explicitly compiled queries is a way for you to, to build out, uh, in a sense, it's a way to build out a predefined link statement that you can assign to, um, assign to a variable and you can reuse that over and over again. So in this example, I have a variable called compiled query, which uh, this would be assigned to a, uh, if I were to include this in a, in a class. And what this is saying is it's a static read only, but uh, it's, a, it's a func that uses my, in this example, it says my entity context, that's just my DB context. And, um, it uses an int, and then it's going to send back. Uh, it's going to be used to send back an enumeration, a set of uh, my entity types. 
And down below, we can see this EF. So we, again, we're using this EF library. And then we're saying compiled query. And in here, we're basically restating the, the func. And we are saying that this compiled query, in a sense, is my context dot my entities dot where, so my entities is just the entity type, so this could be uh, anything. So in previous uh, examples, it could be blog or post or whatever the entity type that, that lives within my DB context. But what I'm saying is where, and then uh, maybe it has an ID, and I, I'm going to send in that ID because I, I set up the uh, int as an input so that that comes in for my ID, and it includes others. So say others is another uh, uh, type that um, is associated with my, is owned by my, uh, my entity type. And then I can say uh, order by the others.name. So, so in a, when I'm creating here is a, is a query that gets compiled at runtime and I can just call it over and over again. So all I would have to do is down here, I could just say compiled query and then give it my, my DB context that, uh, that I want it to be used. I'm going to say the ID is 100 and then I'm going to say to list. So if uh, there were things with ID of, of 100, then I would get those back as a to list. Now, most of the time I'm going to have, looking at this, I'm going to have a, uh, uh, an ID, most of the time uh, a unique ID, but um, it could come back as, as finding more things that have IDs of 100, so who knows. But this is just an example that I could say compile query, give it my DB context, give it my ID, and then it's going to come back. And if there's, if there's more than one uh, of in the set, it just sends it, that back as a, as a list into my results. Now, I do have a demo for this. And we can bring this up. And that one is compiled queries. So let's take a look at this one. Um, this one uses the uh, adventure works. So I do have uh, a folder in here for model. And you can see that it has the adventure works 2014 database. So it, this has a, a, a DB context that you can see right here. Um, and in here, it just has all of my my uh, uh, details on on how this this uh, DB context model is created and everything. But uh, I do have a use SQL Server. It's pointing to a local SQL Server that goes out to AdventureWorks 2014. Uh, I just wanted to show you that. But the magic comes where I. I'm going to run this twice. The first time, I'm going to uh, walk through all of my accounts in my in my AdventureWorks uh, database, and I'm going to uh, have a runtime query that does that does something. So it it does a uh, this link statement. Uh, at runtime and it comes back and and does something and if this demo actually worked I discovered this morning that it was broken it won't run but what this is supposed to do is run through this and and say how long it takes for for this to run through all the accounts and then it comes down here and runs through another test going through all of those account numbers but in this example, it has a compiled query of basically the same same thing that we're doing up here. Uh, this compiled query gets compiled and gets stored, and so uh, .NET Core does not have to kind of 
go through this and and build it each time that uh, I'm calling it like I did before. So it will improve the uh, the performance of uh, my application. Uh, you can trust me; it it does improve the application performance by having these compiled queries. So if you were to uh, have an application that uh, maybe it's calculating, maybe you're calculating the uh, pricing of orders, and some of those pricings get very complicated, um, you can have this compiled query that will allow you to, to basically have it have this link statement kind of uh, set up and and already uh, uh, compiled, ready to be used by uh, by your code. So in this case, I set up this query, and I'm just creating and calling this query and giving it the uh, the DB context and then giving it the ID. And it does improve the uh, the execution of those uh, queries uh, greatly. So let's go back. How much time do we have left, uh, David? Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have ten minutes. Uh, okay. Okay, I'll try to get through quick. Okay, fine. Then we have like really a lot of questions. I just kept them for the end because otherwise I would have interrupted you okay. <laughs> every minute. So just Excellent. keep it in mind. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. So, yeah. so the next one is is database scalar function mapping. So what this really means is that we can we can now in our when we're setting up our DB context, we can have these uh, functions that we can uh, create that we decorate them with DB function uh, annotation that we can create these and use these in our code. So as an example, if I set up a post read count and I'm going to insert a blog ID. Uh, this just sends back an exception, but what we could do in here is we could set up some code that goes out and gets the number of uh, post reads that are uh, that the blog has currently uh, have. So how many how many posts have been read, and then basically down here in my in my link query, I could just say from p in context.post where uh, uh, the number of uh, post reads is count is greater than five. So this is saying that return back any blog posts that have been read more than five times. So this is just a, a, a nice easy way to uh, set this up in your uh, at the DB context level. And allow you to uh, to use them. So let me go out and I will show you the code around this. So again, let me bring up. I think I have a demo for this one. Um, do, 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 do. Maybe I don't. Uh, or I think I do. So so here is what we are doing. So in here. I am getting a DB function, and I'm saying for my blogs, select uh, compute post count. So I am getting uh, blogs, and then I am getting back a count in here. And where that is coming from is if I come down here and take a look at my blogging context, is my uh, DB context that I'm creating. So it creates my, uh, so it gives me all the, the details about my, my EF core model. But in here, I have a compute post count and it takes in a blog ID. And right now it just returns zero, but you could in here figure out how many, how many posts that you have for your blog and it would return that and what, this would end up doing up here is this would send back get back a number of counts so this sends back uh, 
a list of integers, a set of integers based on the number of uh, uh, post counts, number of posts in each blog, and it just pushes that out to the uh, console. So interesting kind of thing that you can do where you can now set up these little functions in your DB context, little DB functions, and you can even give it the schema that you want them to work on um, as an example here. But um, you can kind of do interesting things with this. So let's go back to and wrap up my talk. So things that I want you to know. So quickly, let's go through this. Uh, EF Core 2 is not binary compatible with anything that uses EF Core 1. It is uh, very different. So if you uh, were using EF Core 1 or 1.x, 1 uh, those binaries will not be compatible with, with code that needs to use uh, EF Core 2.0. And then I have a number of different versions, uh, minimum versions of uh, platforms that we that we looked at with uh, .NET Standard 2.0. So don't really need to go through that again. Uh, a few other things is the group by. Grouping is planned for EF Core 2.1. So EF uh, Core 2.1 should come out with uh, .NET Core 2.1 which will be sometime in early 2018. Uh, also, lazy loading is not in EF Core 2.0, but it is planned for 2.1. Um, another thing that I like to use a lot and I've used in the past is spatial data types. It's a high priority, but no release plans have been, have been announced for that. And then, uh, I think I said it before, stored procedures, uh, native support is not supported, but there are workarounds, like I explained, by using uh, raw SQL methods. And again, if you want more information, here's some, some information. If you want, go out to the docs. There are a huge number of documentation around EF Core uh, uh, 2.0. The project is out on GitHub, so just uh, do a search for Entity Framework Core. There's a blog. Most of the, the information uh, for EF Core 2.0 will come out in the .NET blog. And then there are some demos uh, that you can look at uh, out on this uh, uh, GitHub uh, account in this uh, repo called EF Demos. So again, I'll open up for questions. Uh, yeah. And we'll take questions now. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's start from. Uh, so let, let's. We I have fourteen of them. So let's just okay. pick. <laughs> so we'll get through as many as we can. Yeah. So the the first one is uh, that um, yeah people had uh, some performance uh, issues with the uh, entity framework. Uh, uh, let's say standard, not not the EF core. So mm -hmm. the entity framework. Six, uh, and they are uh, wondering if the SQL code that gets generated uh, has been improved uh, or is just uh, basically the same engine behind the scene. So that is a good question. So, so I will say that that there are people that still are finding that uh, that the generated SQL that EF six and EF core uh, emit is not the most efficient. Mm -hmm. So I will admit Microsoft and the EF core team is trying to improve that. Um, it's, it's, I'll say sometimes it's hard to, to optimize because of different indexes and everything that really experienced and highly efficient database developers put into their databases. So so in a in a way the it should be it should be better, but it's probably not going to meet your expectations. Is that a is that a good answer, David? 
Uh, well, I think so. Um, you know, there is a big debate between uh, doing a direct uh, SQL or uh, uh, using object relational mapper, and basically, it's just uh, about what you just uh, said. So it really depends if you have the developer in house or you have to do everything on your own. Then maybe yeah. you don't even have a choice. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I think it's yeah. better, but it it probably isn't going to make most people totally happy. Okay. Uh, another question, and this is more, instead more related to the raw SQL, uh, I think is it, it got a lot of appreciation here, um, is, um, so for example, can I just inject the entire where clause, like select uh, from customer where, and then put the entire where clause as a parameter, as opposed to just saying where customer ID equal to a parameter? Yeah, I, I don't think you can, you can't, that that uh, those parameters go along with the actual behind the scenes of actual SQL parameters that yeah. just like we use with if we're building a stored procedure, writing a stored procedure, um, those parameters are are uh, uh, single are like a yeah, scalar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I, I haven't used the EF core yet, but that's my feeling too. Yeah, I, I don't think you can and, inject a whole segment of yeah. a SQL statement into it. No. Yeah. And okay, so regarding the demo where you showed the the, um, the ability to, you know, filter, post, uh, and keep only the non-deleted one. Yep. The question here is uh, now. Let's say if I want to have some users to see only the deleted the, the or only or also the deleted entries. Would I just create a separate DB context, or there is any different method? That yeah. So I have I have looked at that. So if you are are doing something where your filter depends on a user, uh, a user account, or say a user group, then you're still gonna that will not uh, that will not that can't be set up uh, in the method that I showed. In the uh, in the global quilt, uh, query filters, mm -hmm. those are are specialized, and you would have to build that into your your uh, link statements um, that you build in in outside of your uh, DB context. So as of right now. Um, I mean, technically, you could, if it's a group, you, you can set that up at the controller, at the controller level, and uh, there are some security models around around uh, decorating your controllers to handle that type of security. So, but uh, no, you can't do that in global uh, query filters at this time. Okay. Now, I think we can go for the last one that is related to authentication. I'm not sure about the, the question because it says that they had a problem with uh, so they they were enabled to use integrated Windows security to access the database from the application using uh, uh, EF. Um, do you know if uh, this I mean how this could really happen because I think that EF supports Windows authentication right? Yeah it does. It so does. yeah because the, the, the question was does uh, EF core supports Windows authentication but yeah. Yeah, then well, probably. So EF EF core and EF doesn't actually. So so that at that level, so I build my my security into uh, into my controllers. Mm -hmm. So uh, either I build in the, into my controllers or I build it into my link statements mm -hmm. to say like to check to see if. Um, Build into my controllers. I can decorate my controllers and say that that either the whole controller or maybe an action can only be yeah. accessed by certain certain groups or certain roles. Uh, and then inside there, I can I can uh, so that's how I kind of do security. So yeah. I've I've never seen any of the framework handle the security. It, I mean, any framework yeah. is really just to handle data access. Yeah. And, Getting and building and efficiently allowing you to to do your uh, fluent link statements. 
So yeah. that's a little that question's a little confusing. Yeah, well, I think that the the question here refers to the fact that they were enabled to allow, to connect to SQL Server using oh, Windows authentication. Oh, oh, oh. Sounds now that's part of the brain. connection string. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's so part of the connection string. So that has to do with how how your connection string is is created yeah. and uh, and set up in in your application. Yeah, yeah, but this is a kind of a complex answer because it really depends on the scenario. You may maybe they have faced some problem also using Kerberos if they were delegating something. So Good. yeah, um, okay, just uh, make sure that I wasn't missing uh, anything. And uh, well, that's it. Um, okay. I think we are done. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, to all the attendees, the presentation will be, as has been recorded, and will be available in the next days on our YouTube channel. So if you want to uh, re -re review that, yeah, yeah, just go on YouTube and watch it again. Uh, thank Great. you very much again, uh, Chris. Uh, see you in 2018. Okay, huh? and one thing I didn't put in here is my email yeah. address. So if oh. anyone wants my email address, yeah. it's just chris.woodruff at jetbrains dot com. Okay. Cool. Great. Thank you so much again. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.